Hey, ¿qué pasa, Calexico? Welcome back to the podcast. Um, like always, before I begin, I want to thank my friends here at Calexico Brewing Company for allowing me to record today's episode here. I really appreciate it. Um, today, I have a guest that I, we've been kind of trying to get in um, the pod, this episode, um, you know, recorded, but since he's from San Diego and, you know, he comes every so often to Calexico, but he's a Calesiano, you know, from heart. Um, he's an artist from San Diego, but he's, like I said, he's based from uh, here in Calexico, he's retired in Calexico. My guest today is Ricardo Islas, or the, aka, they call you Dicky Islands. Dicky Islands, my, yeah. the English version of my name, Dick Islands. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to ask you where, where, where did that come from, but but yeah, now now I get it. I, I, think, I think it was a conversation that came up, uh, people talking about, you know, when they say, oh, what's your porn star name? <laughs> and it's like your first pet in the street you grew up on. And I was like, well, I'll just change my name to English, Dick Islands. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's kind of where it came from. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so you grew up here in Calexico. Um, yeah. Yeah. I uh, was born in 1970. Uh, born in El Centro, but we lived here. So we lived here till I was 20. And so then I went to high school here. I went to IVC. Where did you graduate from high school? Uh, 88. 88. Yeah. Um, where in Calexico <laughs> did you grow up? Uh, up until I was a freshman, I grew up on Heffernan, Heffernan Street, right by the uh, Rockwood and mm-hmm. the Little League. I grew up there. And then when I was a freshman, we bought a house off of a, off a cloak in the Nosotros Street. Oh, okay. So I we moved it. over there. So my parents still live there. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and I still got a couple of sisters that live here in the valley. They teach. All my sisters teach. Oh, okay. Cool. Some of them in the Bay Area and, and two here. One in El Centro and one in Calexico. Oh, okay. Who's your... One of them uh, teaches at uh, Blanche Charles. Oh, okay. The last name is Valenzuela. And the other one teaches at Central. And the last name is Higgins. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I work, I work here <coughs> for the district. So I, I'm yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, Liz Valenzuela. Um, so growing up in Calexico, um, I was listening to the Emo, Emo Brown episode. Mm-hmm. Um, Growing up, you were more of a like a metalhead, or yeah, yeah. I was always into death metal and punk, the punk scene. So that's kind of like what I was all about. But was it? Do you think um, it was just something that you? Because <laughs> normally we we tend to listen or or like what our tios or our older brothers um, like. Was it something that it was in your family or just? Uh, no, because like in like in my house. Even though we had records, like, nobody ever listened to music in my house, really. Like, they never had a radio on or anything. I mean, we went to parties in Mexicali. Yeah, we're listening to what they were playing. But in the household, they never really listened to music other than me. Mm -hmm. And I think since, like, junior high, I was listening to, like, say, rock. And then I started finding when stuff started getting heavier, and, and you know, back then you couldn't really listen to music. You just kind of took a chance on stuff. So you kind of went by the look of the band and <laughs> this and that or, or little clips that they wrote about it. And then me and my friends really got into the, I guess, like the underground scene, like what nobody was listening to. So then we would go by record label, you know, like Blast Records or Megaforce or whatever. And we look at reviews, so we just started. We had to order stuff. There was no record store that, at the time, that had that kind of stuff, you know. So there was a music store in in downtown Calexico, and we would just go in there and say, "I want to order this. I want to order that." Mm-hmm. And so we would just order stuff. And sometimes you got a dud, you know. It's like you you're used to this, and then it's like, what the hell did they <laughs> just put out? I know, like uh, you know, like the band Danzig and Misfits. Uh, Danzig put out an album and I bought it. It's like, what the hell is this? This is like church music. <laughs> I'm like, because you were just going by the by the label. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's something that um, I think these the generations that are, you know, listening to music now, um, you know, take for granted that, you know, you know, they have a chance to and you don't even have to buy music anymore. You know, you can, yeah. you know, stream it or whatever. But, yeah. you know, back in the days, you know, you would you would. I mean, I grew up in the 90s. You grew up in, you know, the, in the 70s, 70s, 80s. And it was harder for you to kind of know, you know, if you're going to like the record or not. Yeah. Especially that, that type of music. I don't think it was something that was played on the radio, was it? No, no, not at all. 
I mean, nobody heard that. I mean, even like I since like high school it's for like 27 years, I had long hair. And I mean, nobody had long hair. So it was an automatic strip search at the at the customs. And I'm like, hey, how come you're harassing me? No, it's random. <laughs> it's like <clears throat> but every time. Yeah. So none of my friends ever want to walk across with me. <laughs> So I'd go in and say, it's not random, dude. It happens every time. No, it's random. So they would, like, strip search or whatever. they check you in secondary. And then so I would walk back across when there was no lines back then, right? Uh, yeah. I'd go right back in and come back, but go through another guy in secondary. And I'd go in there. Say, did you forget something? He goes, no, I'm just showing you it's not random. <laughs> like, I, I went back across and, look, I'm here again. Yeah. You want me to try it again? And, and that's the funny thing because, you know, you know, I've always, you know, had short hair. Mm -hmm. um, now I do it because I'm, I'm pretty much bald. So, mm -hmm. and that's a like a stigma or not, you know, a, a, um, you know, you, you kind of get the same treatment because you know they think, oh, you're, you know, probably a cholo yeah, or whatever. Probably a cholo or yeah, whatever. and it's funny because um, it, it, one time we, I, I work at a school, mm -hmm. and um, one of the students uh, had uh, was diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. so. He, he lost his hair, so all the staff, you know. Yeah, shaved their heads. And one time we went to, I went with a bunch of teachers to a concert in Mexicali. Mm -hmm. And on our, on our way back, you know, we got, you know, sent to secondary because it was a bunch of bald guys yeah, yeah, in yeah. the car. So it's like. Yeah, so it, it, it was that. And I mean, we made fun of it. as Like, I started carrying everything. You know, ID, school ID, birth certificates. I wouldn't. So I would have everything I needed. And then when, when they were, like, strips, like, I would go in there with my buddies because they get pulled in, too. And we're like, hey, when they're checking your legs, fart. <laughs> and it's like, hey, don't do that. And I'm like, oh, it's just I can't control it. It's a body function. <laughs> and it just got because it got so ridiculous that every time I went. And it's like, dude, if I get in, if I get called in here every time, why would I try to carry something across the border? Yeah. If every time I'm getting thrown in here, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, that's crazy, and and you know, I was going back to the to the emo uh, brown podcast. I was listening to it, and you were talking about how you kind of grew up working at Norms. Yeah, yeah, I grew up there since I was a little kid. My dad worked there for years, and so that was kind of my my junior high high school job. You know, I'd go in there and the stock, or they had a deli and they had ice cream, so you know, do that, or just pretty much security. Make sure people don't do a beer run, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think beer runs more were more um, common back in, in the nineties. Yeah, 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 because um, they didn't have cameras and yeah. stuff like that. So because now they have cameras, and you could see like when somebody's like parked outside, and yeah. they're like kind of you. You can tell when they're getting ready to. Yeah, I think Norms had like one camera, and that was it. <laughs> like one camera, uh -huh. and that was more like if they got robbed, you know. Oh, and not like really, in the, not like really in, for like a beer run, like in the register kind yeah. of. Yeah. Um, do you remember, you know, what the downtown looked like when you know, or, or what? Yeah, yeah, we'd hang out there quite a bit. Like uh, Fox Theater was like our babysitter, you know, because <laughs> we were like four kids and we drive, you know, my mom crazy sometimes, <laughs> fighting or whatever, you know. So she's like, "Hey, we're gonna drop you off and we'll pick you up hours later," you know. So I think we watched Grease like five times in a row, you know, <laughs> and then they pick us up. <laughs> That's crazy. So we'd go there, you know, and go to Sam Alley's because they had an elevator, you know. It's, uh, like, it's like the only place with an elevator. So like we'd go in there and go up and down. I'm sure they got annoyed, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, because now, you know, I mentioned it because now I don't know if you've gone down there recently. I, ha I haven't recently, but the... Maybe a year ago, I swung by, and I know it's pretty deteriorated, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so, I, but I haven't really gone and walked around or anything. And, and you know, something that I uh, um, kind of, um, I see that you, you know, not hang out, but you're in Barrio Logan, you know, quite yeah. often. Um, and Barrio Logan was, you know, not, you know, like the best place to be you no, know, a yeah, while back. Yeah. And now it's, uh, you know, a little bit better. It's better, but stuff happens here and there. Like, all of a sudden, there'll be a little resurgence of, you know, a shooting or a stabbing or something. I mean, the, I mean, the, the barrio's still there, okay. you know? Yeah. You, I mean, you can gentrify it, but the barrio's still there, yeah. you know? So, you, you know, and, and it kind of goes in waves. 
it was chill for a bit and now it's kind of you know i usually try to get out of there by 10 o'clock mm. you know yeah especially with with family <clears throat> yeah. yeah yeah um so you know growing up listening to like rock death, death metal mm. and all that um did, did you ever listen to like uh, like oldies or stuff like that that because uh, I, mean, I grew up I grew up listening to all kinds of music, but oldies was something that it's till till this day, like you know, something that I, I listened to. Yeah, oldies, oldies. I would say I did, but anything that was current, like when, like say when I was in high school, what everybody listened to, I couldn't stand <laughs> because yeah. there was a lot of beef between, like like the dudes that with long hair and the punk rockers with everybody that was listening to new wave. Mm. Like if I went to a club, I knew like somebody's going to try and jump me, you know, okay, I'm gonna have to fight my way out of here, out of there. Like there was a lot of beef. So if that's where the beef was, I didn't want any part of it. Mm. So I was like, I didn't want to hear anything of Smith's or <laughs> cure or nothing and this and that. So it was, you know, oil and vinegar. Yeah. Do you still not like, <laughs> like the Smith's or, I, or the cure of the Morrissey? I don't like any of that music. It just seems depressing to me <laughs> yeah you know but but i do listen to other stuff that now and i think when i moved up there and i and i i was always hanging out in the bar scene i love to go out i'd always i've always gone out and i started me meeting different people and musicians and stuff and uh so i started getting into other types of music i still like what i like but but i like latin jazz and i and i like jazz and i like you know Pretty much everything other than country. I'm not a big country mm. fan, but for some reason, I I can't stand the Smiths and <laughs> and Morrissey and all that. Mm. And I don't know. It's something about it just seems too depressing to me or something. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I I, I listen to it. It's and it is depressing. But I don't know. There's something that. And yeah. it's funny because a lot of you know people like, um, especially Mexicans that that yeah. immigrate here. They, for some reason, they love the Smiths and Morrissey. The yeah, player. like my homie was the drummer for Los Smiths. Mm. From, and then uh, I have another friend that has a barber shop and huge Morrissey fan, Smiths fan. His his barber shop is called the Arsenal <laughs> uh, from Morrissey, right? Mm. And so they're all huge fans, but I'm just not, I don't know. <laughs> it's just not my, I can't get into it. Yeah, I think it's a yeah, it's an acquired taste because yeah, yeah. I'll put it on and, and my wife doesn't like it. Yeah, it's like uh, early early emo. Yeah, yeah, it's probably like the the first versions of of, of emo, emo music. Yeah. Um, so you you grew up here in Calexico. You went to um, Calexico High School. Yeah, you graduated from here and then you went to to IBC. I went to IBC for a couple years and um, I had no idea what I was gonna do, so I just started taking general requirements. And then a friend of mine was like, hey, take an auto shop class. Like, it's feel, it's fun. It, you just watch film strip and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mess around if your car's broken. Whatever. I'm like, ah, screw it. Because I needed three more credits for, like, financial aid. Oh, okay. Yeah, I like, All right, I'll do it. And it was fun and it was chill. So the next semester I needed three more units. So I, I took another one. And before you know it, I was taking nothing but um. auto shop classes. And then when it came time to get a job... Like, you could get a job in a shop here, but they were hiring everybody from Mexicali because they could pay a minimum wage. Mm. Where I thought, hey, you're, an, you're a mechanic, like, you sh and the tools are expensive. Yeah. You know, I, I have $40,000 worth of tools. Like, how do you buy that on minimum wage? Mm -hmm. And But all the mechanics are using tools from China, <laughs> stuff like that, you know? So I'm like, I can't, I can't do it here. And my wife's like, ah, let's move to San Diego. So we moved up there, and I did an auto shop program at a, at a junior college over there. And there they had an intern program where dealerships went to the to the school and interviewed you, and they'd hire you. Oh. You know, at a starting thing. So I did that, and I, you know, did it for 30 years until recently. Now I'm a full-time artist. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's, it, and it's crazy that, you know, it wasn't something that you had planned and it just happened. No, yeah. And I've never been like a gearhead where I'm like doing it all day and, and I'm doing side work and all this. Like to me, it was just something I did. Like my friends all laugh because I, you know, bullshit them like, hey, man, my car's broken. You look at it. So, oh, man, that that needs a special tool. And I don't have that tool. And, and so they always joke, hey, did you bring that special tool? 
because I knew I just didn't want to work on it because it just like any free time I wanted to do art or hang out. Mm. I didn't want to be under a car and this and that. And then especially when you when you're buying stuff from like uh, aftermarket auto parts, they're universal. So they don't really fit well. Mm. So it's like sometimes it turns a, a, a one hour job to a six hour job because you have to figure out how do you make this work that works on 10 different cars. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, ah, screw that. I don't need that. Especially once I started doing art, like painting wise, I didn't want all my free time was devoted to like, I just want to paint. I just want to draw, just whatever, you know. So um, in between, you know, you know, going to high school and IVC mm -hmm. and all these, when when was it that you you um, remember that you're like, you know what, I, I, I'm pretty good at, at drawing I always, I could always draw since I was a kid and I always checked out even like in elementary, like, like the kids library, I always checked out drawing books and doing little cartoon characters and stuff like that. And then in like fifth, sixth grade, I really got into music and I would draw like logos of bands, you know, ACDC, Led Zeppelin, like in their font, stuff like that. And junior high, I started drawing like redoing like album covers mm. like iron maiden number of the beast or whatever and you know it's got a lot of detail so i always do that and then in high school i i collected a lot of like mad magazine oh, okay. so i would draw all the characters especially like um uh don martin the guy with the long face and the long nose and so i drew that everywhere and stuff and i always loved to do to draw i wanted to go to art school but my mom was like you know you grew up in the valley She's like, what are you going to do with that? And, mm. and she knew I couldn't be in an office. So she's like, you need to do something like vocational, mm. you know, uh, construction or a plumber or something or other. So and not that I was looking for it, but like I said, that's kind of by accident. My friend's like, oh, I'll take an auto shop class. And that's where I ended up, which I preferred being in a shop. Yeah. Then, you know, I, I, I hate being in an office. It's just not me. <laughs> but I always drew. Uh, I took a like an art class in high school, but that sucked. <laughs> like the the lady, the the teacher, and I've I've never run into somebody that taught art that wasn't open minded. But I spent all this time on this image, and and yeah, it had stuff you know, kind of like death metal style. And she just like looked at it and she tore it up. She's like, "Oh, this is trash. You should like as an artist." You should be open to anything, right? Yeah. You know, and, and I was like, all right, well, that was bullshit. You know, now I don't want to do shit here. And and so I would draw, I would make something look nice, but if you look in the in the cross hatching or whatever, I you know, draw a penis on there or something, you know, something like a little <laughs> F you to her, you know. <laughs> so I was like, that that was a downer, you know. Do you remember the teacher's name? Mm, Harmon, I believe. Mm. She's probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh But then I, I took classes in IVC, and I loved it. I loved it there. There was a teacher that was really good at teaching and stuff. And, I mean, there's stuff that I picked up from her drawing classes that I, I still think about when I paint. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, there should be a shadow here because of this or a highlight. or So that was good. And then I even got a little scholarship from IVC. <laughs> and it was funny because it, it was some cash. And then it was a membership to this uh, artist guild uh, in IVC, and uh, not in IVC, in uh, what's it called? The uh, like the J.C. Penney Mall. Oh, uh, Valley Plaza. <clears throat> yeah. So there was like this artist colony or whatever. So I showed up, and at the time, all I did was like kind of characters, and they're pretty, you know, Beavis and Butthead, uh -huh. you know, type of Ren and Stimpy characters. And I went in there with all these drawings and everybody's drawing cactus and desert scenes <laughs> and flowers. And they're looking at me like, okay. And I'm like, I, I mean, I took out one look at what was in there. Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, I'm out. Yeah, I'm not, this is not yeah. for me. This is not for me. <laughs> yeah. So and, then, oh, go ahead. So then I, I moved to San Diego and I, and I always drew, but I, did, I never painted. And probably like in 99, my mom was like, oh, you should take an oil painting class. You know, because she wanted me to paint roosters for her kitchen and all this and, and shit like oil paints. And I took the class and the first semester is more you have assignments to kind of learn how to control paint. 
So that, but but there's other people in the class that are in advanced classes, and then when you get there, all you have to do is paint a series, something that's linked to bit together. It could be the fact that you just use blue paint, mm. or that you use lettering, or do whatever. As long as it's a body of work that's tied together. And I was like, damn, dude, I want to do that. Like, screw this, you know, assignment shit. But I mean, it was necessary because you need to learn how to blend and all this. And once I got in that second semester, I think the first painting I did was uh, this guy that OD'd in the bathtub. And it's this guy lays on his stomach. And it was just kind of based on a few friends OD'd. They were heroin addicts and they OD'd here in Calexico. Mm -hmm. And they all OD'd in the bathtub. Because oh, wow. it was a room with a lock. And they could say, hey, I'm going to take a bath, leave me alone for a mm -hmm. while. And <laughs> so I did it based on that. And it got such a reaction in the class that automatically I felt like when you do punk flyers that are extreme, a guy cutting off his own hand or whatever. So even though it wasn't that, I was getting that same feeling of a punk flyer or mm. a death metal cover or whatever, you know? And the teacher I had, he was a, a well-known Chicano artist and he kind of like saw what I was doing and, and so he kind of like led me to like the path that I'm on, you know, as far as Chicano art and stuff like that. And, but I was doing, I, 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 I like that, I guess, shock value. Yeah. yeah. So for no, probably, I, was think, I was trying to think of the uh, yeah, word. But yeah. So probably for like the first three years, I painted nothing but dead people <laughs> and like murder scenes and stuff like that. And people in class are like, damn, like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I joke with them every once in a while. I'd like, I'm painting and I'm like, <laughs> holding my thumb like I'm painting them, you know, and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> but uh, but after a while, you know, you can only paint so many dead people before you get bored, you know? Mm. So then I started painting poverty, like stuff that other people maybe don't see or aren't familiar because they maybe live in a in La Jolla or something. They don't know this stuff like poverty. Mm. And it was poverty here and poverty in Mexico, you know, people begging for money or 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 a homeless person and stuff like that. So I started doing more struggle. And then eventually I started doing bar shows that were more fun, you know? And so they were more tongue in cheek, joking. And, and so that's kind of when I developed the style that I do now where sometimes it's funny, but there's a message, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, there were still like <clears throat> Mexican situations, but but with a twist, but it's also, if you look at it, there's a message about it, you know? And then I, eventually I did this solo show called Toys Aren't Us. Toys based Aren't, on, aren't mm -hmm. Us, based on the fact that most toys were, were white. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started doing toys converted to Chicano versions of them. You know, so I did like the little people from Fisher Price, but you know, <laughs> there was, I think the original one was uh, like Zapata and Che and Subcomandante Marco. And I did other characters like with the using the little people and I did the green army men, but they were zapatistas. I did the operation game, but instead of bones or classic Chicano tattoos, <laughs> you know, the spider web, the uh, a knife, <laughs> stuff like that, your mom's name <laughs> and, and a, a wagon, a red wagon, but it's a low rider wagon. And that's kind of what I would say that's my biggest thing that I sell now is these toys converted to like Chicano versions of them. Mm -hmm. I do Weeble Wobbles now, what I call my Weevil Wobbles, <laughs> you know, and, but it all kind of was a transition. It was a transition. Right? And, and I, I noticed that you, you know, you, you have a sense of humor. Yeah. And do you, <laughs> you incorporate it into your, into your art, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's something that people say about my work. And along with drawing books, I was always loved joke books. So throughout elementary, like, I checked out every joke book. <laughs> and then in junior high, I started buying these, uh, they're called Truly Tasteless Joke Books. And they're, like, pretty extreme. And they were broken up into chapters, you know, black, Mexican, this and that, handicapped. <laughs> and it's just everything. And I, like, I would carry around, like, seven volumes of it, you know, <laughs> like, in junior high. And it's just, like... I knew every joke there was, you yeah. know, so I, and I think that development kind of sinks into my art now. Cause I, I think I always have a little, you know, there's like some fun to the, 
to the piece. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I asked you about the music and then because now that, you know, you're, it's kind of like um, two different um, kind of um, genres. Like when you were growing up, you're death metal. Yeah. And now like most of your artists, you know, Chicano based. Mm. Um, when you were growing up, did you feel like, you know, you, were, you feel, did you feel Chicano or was it now that you were in the art scene that you kind of. Not here in Calexico. Here in Calexico, I think I, I I never really, I guess I wasn't around that term, but I think it's more when I moved to San Diego that I, that I really saw like the racism that you start, you know, you know, just like, hey, I'm going to be here because this is where you feel safe type of thing, mm-hmm. you know, and I ran into a lot of that there. And then being in the punk scene and all that, the clubs I went to, there were skinheads, there was there was Nazis that would show up, and me and my friend would would go in there, and we're always in there. And the and the the owner, he's like, "Hey man, you guys are always in here. Um, I'll put free beer anytime you want, as long as you help the security guard. If there's an issue, like, yeah, pff, whatever. Punch a Nazi, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so beer, yeah. yeah, so." That's what we did, and it was, and and that's when you, we, I guess I felt like un, not connected, and then we we were living not too far from Chicano Park. We were living in downtown when we first moved there, and then we ended up randomly at Chicano Park, and it was Chicano Park Day, and we walked around, and it's like holy shit, like I feel, mm-hmm. I feel home, mm-hmm. I feel a connection. It reminded me of in Calexico when they had the big fiestas you know 16 of september all this that they got you know food booths and music and all this so right away we both felt this connection and and so i never forgot that so we would go to chicano park every year you know it's not like we hung out there but we did that but then when the art scene kind of moved there i mean it felt right you know like you know and then that's when i was kind of like you know okay i am chicano you know and i identified I think more so because it's like you need to have a like a click or mm-hmm. whatever, you know. Uh, you know, and and here everybody's Mexican, you yeah, know, the majority, pretty, uh-huh, pretty much. So I don't see where here you would be like using that term mm-hmm. again. Know? And I feel that um, <coughs> um, it, it's it's a common thing, you know. People mm-hmm. leave the valley mm-hmm. and they they you know they 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 see all the racism or discrimination yeah. and they like you mentioned you need to find somewhere where you feel at and home calm, at calm phase, where you can relax where you can you know sp- yeah. speak spanglish yeah, or yeah. spanish and you know be okay um and yeah and because when i grew up in, in in high school i think that was like like some of the first time or the first time when they started um teaching like chicano studies mm-hmm. and you know uh, Chicano uh, drama, like all these, yeah, yeah. you know, they started incorporating Chicano, and and you know, I, I feel that a lot of the people that um, uh, were taking those classes or or um, consider themselves Chicanos were mm-hmm. people that um, came from a lot of friends that came from Salinas or stuff yeah, like yeah. that. They came to the valley, you know, they were the ones that you know were in the Mecha Club. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to me, like, I, I was always like, you know, well, I, you know, I don't, I like the culture, you know, mm-hmm. I like the oldies, I like, you know, blood in, blood out, Mercury, yeah, yeah. like all those. Um, but I, I don't know, it was hard for me to, to kind of understand, you know, what, what a Chicano is or, and, 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 and that's something that I, that I asked, like a lot of people that, you know. Yeah, I know. I, I heard a podcast with, uh, Roberto Pozos mm-hmm. and I know him from San Diego, but I know you know, he does a lot with that. And I think he was in Mecha and all that. Mm. And, but yeah, it's something, I don't, I don't know. It's like a support, I guess. And, and, and I guess being in the scene, you, you see a lot of like poets talking about it and you, and then it hits you like, yeah, you know, I was treated like this, you know, and, and it's, it gives you some strength, mm. you know, I have some friends that are in a comedy group that have been around like 35, maybe 40 years, culture clash. And they would do plays all over universities, all over the U.S. and stuff. And and they were talking about that, 
forever and you'd go to one of their plays and it's talking about that and it's like you're right you know like we need to stick together to i mean even like the walkouts i mean that was based on the chicano movement because if not they never taught anybody advanced courses because they're like oh they're gonna be a waiter they're gonna be a bus boy they're gonna be this there's let's not waste time on that and it wasn't until the chicano movement that pushed all that agenda to where why aren't we getting better books if the other school's getting better books? And that's all created by that Chicano movement, you yeah. know. They, they realize, hey, if we don't show up to school, they don't get paid, you know, so let's stay out of school. And that affected them, right? That affected the, the school. Their pockets, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and I remember asking, um, I think it was Eric Reyes. I don't know if you know Eric Reyes. He's from Brawley. Sounds uh-huh. familiar. He was a teacher in Calexico mm-hmm. for a while. Um, and I asked him, like, like for him, what it was, what it meant to be a Chicano. Mm-hmm. And I think the way he, he described it, kind of like, I understand it now. That's how I kind of feel like it's kind of like a state of mind, uh, yeah. you know, you know, being part of this, you know, this culture. And, yeah, like, to me, I like, told him, yeah, and then I guess I'm, you know, might not always be a Chicano, but there's times when I, you know, you know, feel like, you know, well, the fact that you stand up for yourself if you say something that's wrong, mm. you know, because a lot of times people wouldn't say anything or it's all about appearance or, or acting the way that they expect you to act. Mm. You know, like, I mean, even like, like, say with me with long hair, my mom was like, hey, when are you going to cut it? And and she was worried about what other people were going to say. And now to me, I was like, who cares what they say? Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. Mm. You know, and that's what I'm going to do, you know. And so it's that state of mind where it's funny because, like, my grandmother wasn't like that. But my mom was more, oh, what are they going to say in church? What are they going to say here? What are they going to say there? And the older generation, you know, they just kind of, you know, life was rougher. So they're like, hey, whatever, that doesn't matter. You know, just as long as you're working, as long as this, you know. Surviving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, yeah, it was harder for for our grandparents, that, I mean, I'm, I'm first generation here, but, mm-hmm. you know, my grandparents, even Mexicali, you know, they, that's where they live. You know, they had it rough, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then my dad came over here and um, he had it a little bit better. So, but yeah, they had it, you know, they, they our grandparents didn't have, you know, a harder time, you know. Especially, yeah. you know, my, my dad had, I think it was like nine siblings. So like, mm. you know, or... Our grandparents had bigger families too. To yeah, who? I think my dad. They were fourteen. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Are your parents from from the valley, también, or? Uh, yeah, essentially, my dad was born in Sonora, but they moved here when they were babies, you know. But the, so they've been in Mexicali for years. I still have a lot of family in Mexicali, and, and then my mom was born in Indio, in, but her family was from Sonora also. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Hey guys, sorry for the interruption, but I wanted to take this time to thank my sponsors. I want to thank my longtime sponsors, my friend Camilo Garcia, Eddie Lopez from Roots Creative, and my friend Jake. Thank you guys for being longtime sponsors of the podcast. I also want to thank my friends who sponsored the podcast in 2022. Thank you so much. I really, uh, really appreciate your sponsorship. And if you want to become a sponsor, you can go to anchor.fm backslash que pasa calexico. Hit the support button and you can sponsor the podcast from 99 cents a month to $10 a month. Um, it really helps me a lot to make this podcast better, sound better, look better, and reach out more people by promoting the podcast in social media and other websites. So um, if you want to become a sponsor, make sure to go to my anchor page and I'll leave a link. Also leave a link in the description of the show. So thank you so much. And um, now back to the show. Um, so now that you're, um, doing this full time, um, do you think you have, um, is it harder for you to like, um, not have a nine to five and then, or is it better that, do you find it better to, to focus on your art than, than, I mean, I guess it's harder and more stressful, but, but I enjoy it where the nine to five was like. I was working, but I was always thinking about art the whole time, like 30 years. I was like, while I was working, I was thinking about art. You know, I, especially when I started, I was like, 
that's what I was all about. You know, like I was doing shows like every two weeks and people are like, man, how do you get in all these shows? Like, but like I always tell people, like, if if you don't hang out, nobody's ever going to discover you being locked away in your house. Mm. It doesn't matter how great, amazing the artist you are. If you're not out there, how are people going to know about you? So I, I was always out, you know. I I go to work and I come home and I paint and then I I go out out all night and that's where I I made a lot of connections through meeting poets, meeting artists, meeting musicians, you know, because they all run in the same circles, you know. If you have an art show, you're gonna have a musician or a DJ play, and it's all kind of intertwined and stuff. But mm. I always tell people, you you know, younger artists like, dude, you have to go out. You can't just be because that's where you're gonna make your connections. And if you look at history. Every famous artist has a painting of a of a cafe in France or or a bar or whatever because that's where they got together and they had common bonds of whether the art they were doing or or doing rebellious shit you know like hey I'm gonna paint you know cubism you know the people are like what the fuck is that it's shit and yet now it's the most expensive artwork yeah. you know even like the impressionists where it's just kind of like blotches. From far, it looks like a realism, but you look close and it's just a mess, you know? Mm -hmm. And people thought that was shit. And now that's one of the most expensive pieces, too. Yeah. But those artists would get together and they would hang out together. And, and the, all, you see all their paintings and they're at this cafe, at this bar. And it's like you, that's how you make connections, you know? Nobody, nobody's gonna, you're not gonna get anywhere if you're just sitting at home. Yeah. Just like a band, you know, if you don't, do a gig here and there how the hell is anybody gonna know if you put it on on the internet still you gotta do the local thing or yeah whatever. and especially like say you go to a bar you play and there's somebody a couple people there that listen to you they liked it they share it with somebody else mm -hmm. and you know that's like how they spread um so what would be your drawing of the bar that you you know you mentioned you know mm -hmm. there's artists that have a cafe or a bar what would be the one you <coughs> i would say there's a bar that I used to hang out at that it it used to be it was actually a, a block away from where I first moved to San Diego and there was a bar next to me and I hung out there but then there was a bar about a block away that nobody ever went in there it was like like my friend calls it bar monsters <laughs> it was like the daytime drinkers that are you know they just like get two three super strong drinks and pass out mm. It was that type of bar. Like, it closed at, like, 9. And then one day, I saw my homie out there. And he's worked at a bunch of bars in San Diego. And he was a DJ. He's like, hey, man, I just took over this bar. Like, why don't you cruise by? He's all right. And he's been in the bar industry forever, especially being a DJ and all that. And he was a graffiti artist. So he put out a velvet rope. And this is, like, a grimy, grimy <laughs> bar. And all of a sudden, it was like, that is a velvet rope. But he was smart enough to where, where you walked in and if somebody else walked in and he knew him, he's like, hey, so-and-so, uh, this is so-and-so, and, and you talk. And now when you go in there, if that guy's there, you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that he did that to everybody. Whoever you were sitting next to, hey, this is so-and-so, I don't know if you met him, he's an artist. Oh, this guy's a tattoo artist. This guy's a graffiti artist. And before you know it, it became this underground, super popular spot. And it was like a lot of like regulars. And there was a lot. I mean, it was so cool that I mean, like uh, like the guy from the Roots DJ there. And this is like a little grimy, divey bar. Yeah. And the guy from the Roots was there. There was a line around the block. And it's oh, like wow. they're never going to get in because nobody's going to leave. <laughs> yeah. Or even though there was a line because we were like regulars. We were there seven days a week. Mm. You walk up and like, what line? I don't see no line. You just walk in. But. There were so many, like, famous people in there, and it was super grimy, but that's what made it cool. Mm. Then they had a DJ, and the police department was half a block up, and they started getting, I think they were getting trouble because they didn't have a cabaret license. So there was apartments on top of it, really old apartments. So the manager lived upstairs, so he literally ran a wire from his apartment to the bar, and he had his little pencil camera. And so the DJs would DJ in his kitchen. Oh, wow. And on the TVs, 
you could see the DJs DJing in his kitchen. Uh-huh. And and they were getting around the law by not having the DJ in, in the, the bar. Uh-huh. And then I take off and I go up there. He's like, how the hell did you get up there? <laughs> you know? And then the guy that used to wash dishes in the bar, uh-huh. he'd go up there and wash the guy's dishes and stuff. <laughs> But then later, later they got a better camera and it kind of killed it. Uh, like it, it was better when it was grimy. Yeah, grimy and all. Yeah, but we did a lot of art shows there, and I think it's just the the amount of people that that you never knew you were next to. You know, famous DJs, famous artists, and 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 there was a gallery right next door that I used to show at. What do you think? Like a grimy spot like that would become like <laughs> like the place to be. I think that place was because of the fact that he introduced everybody and you felt at home no matter what day you went because you're going to run into somebody you've been introduced to. Mm. It's like that comfort of you walk in and it doesn't matter what day you walk in, you're going to know somebody. Yeah, Yeah, like feeling like a regular. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that uh, because here in Calexico, we have um, 111. It's Mm -hmm. been, but now it's under new new ownership ownership or. Uh-huh. This girl from um, Hikali, she plays it in a band. Mm. She bought it probably like, I don't know if it was like months before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And she was struggling to keep it open. She's still she's still open. But um, yeah, I feel like it, um, there's a guy there. Shout out to Ruben. Um, he's always like, he's always there. And he try, try, tries to talk to everybody. Yeah. And I feel like that's what, you know. Yeah. But I, I would recommend like for the owner, if she knows people introduce them because that is gonna pay off in the end you know you got a dude that hangs out there and somebody else and you never know what people are into there was a guy that used to hang out there that was way older and you know he was kind of like you get there get fucked up and leave sometimes carried out but you would never expect the job he had like he worked in television and in talking to him it's like oh he used to box and he had a nose you could tell he was a boxer Mm. And then he worked in television. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, but you would never know it. But after that, like, you could tell he was comfortable because, you know, we're like, hey, what's up, Larry, or whatever, you know. And and it's just introducing everybody to everybody. People are going to want to come more because they're like, hey, man, like, you know, Larry said he's going to be there or whoever, you know. And you go because you want to hang out, you know, where sometimes here in the Valley, you can't find what to do, right? Like. You're like cruising around everywhere. Like, Man, there's nothing. Hmm. But if you have that, no matter what day you go, you're gonna know somebody. Somebody, yeah. And I think that's what really made that place. Yeah, and especially know. here, it's easier to kind of do that because it's a smaller town. <laughs> yeah, and like probably the same people are gonna be there. Yeah, yeah. it's easier to to kind of bring that 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 vibe, that environment. Yeah, to, to us. yeah. I tell that to everybody. Like, dude, like if you have a spot, like. If you know somebody sitting next to somebody, introduce them and tell them what they do. And I mean, it's not only like it might be business for them if it was a tattoo artist, you know, I meet him and like I might want a tattoo from him or, or art. You know, he might want to buy an art piece and mm-hmm. and it's going to work out for everybody. Yeah. You know, if you go in there and it's dead, oh, there's just two people and I don't know. them. I'm, I'm going to leave after one beer. But if you introduce everybody, you're going to go and you're going to sit next to them because you know them. And then you're probably going to have two or three beers. Mm-hmm. So it's good for the business, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, going back to your art, um, and it's something that I um, kind of ask people that have gone and, and you know, become a little bit, um, uh, they, they, they make it into a career. Do you mm-hmm. think that here in the Valley you would be able to to do, you know, say, like, oh, I'm going to quit my job and or retire from my job and, and do this full time? Yeah. A career, no, not not in painting or anything like that. Maybe in uh, doing stuff with computers, like advertisement, something like that. But as far as art goes, I don't see it happening right now. I think the when I've when I've done shows here, I've done it just because friends asked me to. Mm. But sales, the the amount of money that people are willing to pay for art is not what it should be Mm -hmm. you know and i understand the struggle the economics of of the valley Mm -hmm. you know you know and it's really just comes down to that Mm -hmm. you know i saw some i think the first show i did was um it was in el centro 
with uh, the man. kayak. At the yeah, kayak. The, the guy that owned the kayak. Yeah, what's that? Jared, Jared, Jared Storm. Mm-hmm. It was at his gallery. He had a little gallery, and there were some tattoo artists that had some work there that was pretty amazing. And then it's like forty bucks. I'm like, dude, like, if you spent four hours on the piece, like, what? Are, what's the dollar amount you're working for per mm-hmm. hour? You know, like, yeah. like really, and and. And I think maybe people don't understand too. They're like, "Oh, I like the piece," but you gotta think how many hours did they spend on that piece. Material. And, and as an artist, you should think how many hours did I spend? What's minimum wage? You know, at least that. Mm-hmm. You know, at least that. But it shouldn't be that. But at least that. And and I see it all the time with young artists that one of the the hardest thing to do is decide to say you're an artist. You know, to tell people, yeah, I'm an artist. Like, whether you have a nine to five, but if you do art, it takes a long time for people to say, oh, I'm an artist. Mm-hmm. And then the next step is pricing. I, I mean, I try to help out. People ask me all the time, and I said, okay, well, you know, I don't think if it's original, I don't think it should be cheaper than, like, say if it's a painting, I don't think it should be cheaper than $100 if it's, it's a one of a kind. And... And then you put it in a show, but you as an artist need to go to a lot of shows. And then you see stuff that's sold. You say, hey, that's sold for 150 I think my stuff's the same or better. If that's sold for 150 okay, I'm going to bump it up to 160 And you keep doing that and you see other work and it's like, well, it's sold over here for 300 mm-hmm. Why wouldn't my stuff be 300 And that's kind of how you you develop your your pricing, but... I don't know, when I see stuff for 40, 60 bucks that's original, it just seems kind of like a like a crime. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it shouldn't be that. They you should take a little more pride in mm-hmm. in the the work that you do. Yeah, and, and and like you mentioned, you know, here um, you know, people are gonna decide whether they wanna pay a hundred dollars for a piece or maybe take out their family to eat. Yeah. You know, it's it's yeah, it's a... Uh, the difference in, in you know, the, the economics is... Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I think what they could do also is is sell the piece for 150 or 200 or 300 whatever it is, depending on the work, but make prints and sell prints. Sell prints for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40 bucks. Mm-hmm. Sell that, but the original, if somebody really likes it so much, then they're, whoever really wants it, to say, man, I'd love to have the original. Then you sell the original for for more money. Don't sell the original for, for what you would for sell. forty bucks, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean you go work anywhere minimum wage and two, three hours mm-hmm. you're gonna have that money. Like like this is a one of a kind piece that you created. Like don't don't diminish it, you know, that yeah. it's and, and and do you think sometimes it's be, they 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 kinda set the price that that way because they see it, you know, they might have their nine to five and then they see this, you know, as a like a, a hobby or. Yeah. S- I, I mean, I think that happens or or everybody has that mindset. So the price stays that low. Mm-hmm. You know, the price stays that low. Like normally in, in San Diego, like. I try not to do big group shows that have a lot of people that are maybe starting out because. You know, they're, they're always going to, you're going to run into that where they're like, oh, I'll, I'll give it away for free if somebody wants it. And then it makes you look like an asshole because you're asking for 500 mm. But, I mean, I've been doing it a long time and I've made a name for myself and, and I mean, I can't work for free, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, but that, that takes a long time to develop you to say, hey, my stuff is worth this, you know? Mm-hmm. Have you had any, any, you know, artists from the Valley, you know, reach out to, you know, for any advice or... Oh, people hit me up all the time. Mm. Um, there's one guy, um, and I don't know his last name, but I went to high school with his mom. <laughs> but his Instagram is just Felix. I don't know if you Felix, know him. No. But he he does... Uh, he's painting a lot of murals in restaurants here in the Valley. Mm-hmm. And then he also... I just bought a piece from him. He did a, a rug. He makes rugs. And... Uh, my homie Chicle, he does all the design work for like Emo Brown. So there's a character he did for Emo Brown that's like this skeleton 
with a flipped up hat and a bandana that says like South Bay, but I had him put his signature on there. And so he did a three foot rug for me and I gave it to Chicle for his birthday. Oh, cool. And he do, he's doing some pretty cool work. Mm-hmm. I think he paints shoes and stuff like that. And yeah, and I just, I think he heard the podcast I was on with Tribal, the lower left podcast. Mm-hmm. And then he was talking to his parents and his mom's like, oh, I went to high school with him. And then he hit me up and, and I just kind of gave him some advice on paint and stuff like that. And we just kind of kept in contact. And so recently he, a week or two ago, a week ago, he came up there to give me that rug. Mm-hmm. So Chicle was having a show. So Felix is his handle? At, yeah, at his just room? Felix. Okay. Yeah. But he's from here, from Calexico. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I think his dad might be like a fireman or something. Or other. Oh, okay. I'll look him up. But, yeah. but I don't I don't know his last name. Oh, okay. Um, oh, so what was my question? I had a question then, and then I lost... <coughs> So what what would you call your the style of you know you your paintings? Uh you know I always have a tough time with that question. I mean it's the general I guess it's Chicano art but it's been named several things uh pop art post surrealism folk artish I don't know it's just I I don't I don't really know other than to me, it's more about uh, cultural identity, you know, because I don't do one style. You know, I'll do mm-hmm. regular portraits. I do skulls, skeletons. I do the toys. So I don't, I guess it doesn't all mix because I really just do whatever I feel like like doing. Like, I don't like to do a body of work because every day you feel different, right? Mm-hmm. You know, one day you, you're happy, one day you're pissed or whatever. So I see the same as a body of work. I know artists do like, I'm going to paint a whole body of work for this show. And I always try to title everything like random thoughts or stuff like that, because I have a lot of ideas and I want to do, Hey, I want to do this toy thing and I want to do this, this bloody thing. And I want to do this. And so I, I don't like doing like one theme. I do toys, but I usually don't do like just a toy theme other than the first one I did. I, I do different stuff. So. Yeah, because yeah. because so, uh, yeah, I've seen you know it it varies. You yeah, know? it's not it's not always the, yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah. But mm. you do have um, I guess like the toy is something that you, you yeah you come with, back to yeah mm-hmm. because I think those are the ones that people really like that and the skeletons like the Dia de los Muertos not Dia de los Muertos but like say like the shirt you know like uh, people love like the the skeleton stuff. Mm-hmm. So I do the, the skeleton stuff. I can't. Everything I paint sells. The toys they all sell. So those are, you know, I, I would say the majority that I paint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw the you had a like a Pez. Yeah, and then like the little what was it? Little guys. That's what, that's what they call yeah, them. Little people. Little people and the, and the weeble wobbles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you ever use? Um, is all you do? Everything you do is painted, not not comp- on computer. No, no, I don't. I'm very computer literate. <laughs> Extremely computer literate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah because I, I, I know. Um, I, do you know Fernando Reza? No. No, he does post like movie posters for like Sony and stuff like that. He's no, but I, I heard the podcast he was on. Mm. Yeah, um, but no, I don't. I didn't know who he was. Yeah, and, and it's all, you know, on computer. Yeah. Um, I think I was a little late in the game. Like computers first came around when I was in high school. Mm. And that was only for the advanced students. So I never touched it. And then my wife bought one when we were up there. But <laughs> I was just, you know, I was always out. So I just never been around enough. And even when I bought one, like mm-hmm. people would joke, mess with me because uh, I bought an Apple computer. Like when they did the one that, oh, that was a half the- ball uh-huh. and the screen, I bought it. And it literally sat in the box in my kitchen for like six months. Whoa. And then it's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I don't know how to set it up. <laughs> So what do you mean? He's like, well, let me have it. And then when you're ready, like, I'll give it back to you. And then finally, like, because I didn't know how to set up, like, just for, like, you know, the the modem or anything, like. Like uh, for the internet? Yeah. I'm like, I mean, I was that clueless, you know? Yeah. And even, like, social media, like, my homie Chicle, he was the one that, hey, you got to get a MySpace, you know, advertise shows. and then So he set it up for me. And then when Facebook came around, 
he set it up for me you know i mean now i'm better at it but you do your own um social media stuff or yeah because yeah it's i mean social that's how i find a lot of Mm -hmm. you know i think i think that's how i i found you um especially here in the valley a lot of people that i Mm -hmm. that i found that are artists is through through instagram is yeah yeah. i think the the biggest um, yeah facebook you don't see too much on there anymore Mm -hmm. it's mainly instagram Mm -hmm. and yeah like i mean when i started everything was flyers Fly, even even to show in a place, everybody requires slides. And and I was like, how the hell do you get a slide, you know? <laughs> then I had to get a friend to come over and shoot slides. And then you had to shoot, I forgot, I think they called it bracketing, where you shoot at three different exposures. Because depending on the painting, one exposure might be better. So you were taking three photos of each piece. And then you develop them. And then it's like, okay, this one looks more like it. This one looks more like it. So then you just waste all these. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, digital came in and it's like people wanted a disc, you know, of your work. And now pretty much you just refer them to a website or a website or or whatever or or a a social media. You have a website as well? No, I I had one and uh, nothing ever came of it. Nobody ever hit me up. Hey, I saw your website. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm like, ah, screw that. You know, so I just social media. Yeah, I think um, I have a website and to be honest, it's been like a year and a half since I updated it. Yeah. Um, I see, and you know, I, I see people going in there every so often, but it's not enough for me to. Yeah. It's almost better just to have a social media mm-hmm. for what you do. Yeah. And that's it. Like websites, I don't I think they're kind of on the way out too, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unless you, unless you have a business where, well, yeah, especially like if you if you can buy stuff off your website, you know, yeah. that's that's uh, the best thing. But yeah, for me that it's a podcast, it's like um, a lot of the times the website is just there to redirect somebody to to my social media or yeah. or Spotify or whatever. But yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, I, I don't know, I, I don't have the time for a website right now. Yeah. And like me, like I just have like a big cartel page where, you know, it's kind of like Facebook. You just it's a business page you order and you just link it to your social media. Mm. And then you just put whatever name, you know, uh, Ricardo Islas dot big cartel com. And 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 there I just upload products and and people. And then when you open it, you get a PayPal account like they, they, they work with PayPal. So so you're paying through the website and PayPal takes taxes and all that. And oh, okay. So yeah, it's, it's, you don't have to yeah. deal with and it. And you just upload it just like if you're uploading pictures in, in Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Okay, cool, cool. So we're almost at an hour now. Um, and I try to keep them like, yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask you or we talked about that you would like to, um, no, I, I hope to do more shows down here. You know, I, I tried going to the it's a cultural center here, though. Mm, uh-huh. but it seems like they do stuff more on weekdays. Yeah. So it's kind of tough to get out here, but I'd like to check that out. I did come once for a, uh, the, the Domingo Yoa show they had several years ago mm. before pandemic. And But, I, you know, I'd like to do more stuff here. You know, um, they've done here in Calexico, they've done... Um, you know, Roberto Pozos was here one time, mm-hmm. so I'm sure, like, if we, if you ever need a spot, like, it mm-hmm. would be it would be done to, to host here. Yeah, it's just tough on the when it's a weekday. You mm-hmm. know? No, and they can do it on a weekend mm-hmm. if, if you're if you ever need a spot. Um, yeah, you can probably get their their info and they'll be done to, to host. That'd be cool. Um, but I, I'm glad to see that there's more of an art scene now because when I was here, there was there was no art scene mm-hmm. here, nothing at all, and now. I see they were having like the art walk and and stuff like that. And I think a cousin of mine I was started that with some other people. Who's your cousin? Roxana. Oh, okay. I, I had her last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to her last week. Oh, cool, cool. I didn't know she was your cousin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that I had her last week. She was on the podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. last week. Um, but but yeah, I, I think um, more people are feeling comfortable because like when you mentioned that. Um, sometimes it's hard for you to call yourself an artist. Yeah. I think more people are, are feeling more comfortable. Um, and I think, I think, um, 
especially Instagram has a lot to do with it because mm. um, people that are looking for artists, that's where they go to. And I think yeah. that, that helps, you know, bring people out and especially here in Calexico in the Valley. Yeah. The, and I've met a lot more now that I, I did like the Viva del Valle show and all that. And I've met a lot of artists, but mainly mainly from El Centro mm -hmm. and Imperial and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, El Centro has a lot of... Uh, um, I always talk about Jared, Jared, and when they he had the kind, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they they have this little clique where they support yeah. each other, and and I think it's really really fun that they do, really cool that they do that, that kind of that yeah. kind of thing. So, um, like Ernie, um, the guy that ha um, owns Meshka, mm -hmm. he always tries to like organize events where they not only art. Well, I mean, yeah, it's artists because they you know they have like um, little events where people can set up their booth and sell. Their prints, stickers, mm -hmm. jewelry, um, and I think that's something that's missing here in, in Calexico también. Yeah, and I think once you start doing more events like that, it becomes more of a community. And I mean, just like Logan, there was no art when when the first gallery moved there, and it was it was rough when they first moved there. You know, he was you know, homies were going in there. What the fuck is this? You know, and it's like, but he's cool with them. And sometimes he's like, hey, you gotta fight, you gotta fight. Yeah. You know? But then. It succeeded, and then it pretty much developed what it is now. Mm -hmm. From people that hung out at that gallery, they all spread and opened up their own spots and stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's good and bad, I guess. Like, the good part is it changed the scene, but the bad part is gentrification sets in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it's sometimes it's hard because you want to um, see like a community get better, but mm -hmm. sometimes you know that. Um, you know, it turns into something yeah. else that you weren't expecting, and it yeah. and it impacts you know people that were living there for you, yeah. you know, years and years. That it gets harder for them to like pay rent. And stuff yeah, like pay that. rent. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that goes. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Ricardo, thank you for especially reaching out because, like I told you, um, you know, I was I was about to uh, you know reach out to somebody and and you know see if they wanted to be on, and then you you sent me a message, and it was like you know perfect timing and and it's, i'm glad because we, we you know i know we talked about it in the past about you you coming on the podcast and, and you know having the chat yeah and thank you I, I mean it always seems like i i come just for a few hours and i leave so i'm like man i could never do it yeah and this time i was like you know i'm gonna be there on a saturday like screw it like let's do it yeah, yeah for sure thank you. thank you thank and you I enjoy the podcast yeah man. thank you for for the conversation and um tell, where can people you know find your 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 stuff what's your on instagram it's real ricardo islas and on facebook it's just ricardo islas okay and i'll put links on on the description of, of today's episode so people yeah. can can check it out and, and follow you and and you know see if you have any shows coming up and stuff yeah like for that. sure thank you now that you're you know doing it Full time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening or watching, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Peace.